welcome to the MMA Roadshow, episode number 179. My name is John Morgan, and Cold Coffee is with me. What? We are back. It's been a while, man. I feel like, feel like it. it feels like we, we go through these spots where it's it's just too long. I know. We, you go on the road like every other week <sighs> or every week. It's been a stretch. There's been uh, quite a few fights, it feels like. It has been. It's kind of nice to have a, a, a week off. I mean... We're sitting down to record this on a Thursday night, as we always do here in Las Vegas at the Casa de Cold Coffee. Lovely Las Vegas. It's actually the weather. The weather's hot. Quit trying to. It is hot, but it feels. Doesn't it feel cooler outside? Like what was it the other day? Uh, cooler as opposed I guess, to like an oven. Yeah. Yeah, it's way cooler. I guess when we were leaving the PI, I remember thinking like, oh, it's not so bad. And I think it was still like a hundred degrees, oh. but it felt it felt decent, you know, because it's not it's not a hundred and thirteen. It's not. That is true. 117. We're, get, we're getting there, bro. It's the end of August. Uh, September's coming. The, the it's 100 first few right weeks now. of September. It's a nice t- <laughs> temperate 100 outside. Are a little rough. Once we get to October, though, October and April. If you can be yeah. in Vegas in October or April, those are our two best months of the year. It is nice. But it has been a while. So here, it's a, say it's, I would say it's a non fight week. It's not a non fight week. There's. Uh, you know, a couple of events this weekend. We got Cage Warriors. We got Invicta right now. Professional uh, Fighters Ooh. League is going on right now. But of course, we're doing a little day drinking, having a little. Yeah, what are we drinking today? This is a little different. Uh, yes, this is a. Uh, is this a, a, a John a, Morgan sponsored? This is. <laughs> th- this is not. Although I do love the fine <laughs> folks. This is a uh, a small brewery that a lot of people haven't heard of. Um, oh, oh it's, yeah, it's only been established since 1978. It's true. So it's kind of kind of young. It's up in Colorado. <laughs> Um, the I like the the picture. What is that? A a mountain range? That's the Rockies. Uh, oh, it's a rock. This was actually born in the Rockies. Oh, that makes sense. The Rockies, then. Yeah, and the Colorado Rockies. There you go. Exactly. So this is all about that. This is uh, we this call is a craft it beer then. Coors Light. Oh, very much a craft beer. Craft beer. <laughs> I've always wondered what craft beer tasted like. This tastes like the other beers. <laughs> This tastes like other hey, light beer. <laughs> you talk bad about the fine folks at Coors Light. Ship me a case of beer in the I know. mail. And they I sent said, you some swag. Didn't they, didn't they send I you do. Like I've a got hat some or Coors Light swag around the house. I need to. Oh, Patreon listeners. Mm, maybe get that out. <laughs> maybe get that out. Because, yeah, because it's, I mean, uh, who was ever able to get a hold of Coors Light swag? I know. I mean, it's not like you see that it's, everywhere. It's rare. I mean, it's not like. It's rare. I bet everybody can go in their closet and find a T-shirt. <laughs> I know I saw one not too long ago that was like, oh no, that was a Corona one. That's another one. Oh, Corona like, did well. Every they bar like everything. on like Cinco de Mayo, it's like you find this random shirt that you're like, where did I even get this from? You're like, remember that bar we went to on that one Cinco de Mayo? You're like I don't remember, but I, I'll go with your story. I, I I won't argue with it that it probably happened. Well, we are having a couple of frosty Coors Lights this afternoon, and uh, we'll be together next week in Dallas. So we get a little two week uh, stretch at Dallas. least. Looking forward to it. My I am hometown. looking forward to it. Dallas is a fun place, man. The humidity can get up there, mm. and uh, but it's always fun. Like the food's always good. Um, it's it's bad that that's like my first go to thing when I think about going to a location. I'm like, all right, do they got good barbecue there? And what they are they do. known for? But like Dallas, Dallas has a good scene. I mean, we'll not like we ever really Pecan get Lodge. to get out and we'll definitely be in uh, Lodge. Pecan Lodge is so good. We'll get some other. Yeah, not like we get to go out and hang out. And no, really. but I mean like. There's there might be that small little break in between events where or uh, it's like all right we just shot this thing for like three hours and we can go back and edit for four hours but how about an hour in between can we can we sit and have some delicious barbecue that we, place is legit Dallas got good barbecue you take me to a few bar, uh, yeah, yeah. barbecue joints there Sunny Brian's I love Sunny Brian's is that barbecue the one little place that there's that little old school one that we always yeah, go by yeah you go to like the uh, you sit down at like a little school old desk. school that's, benches that's the original one on Inwood that's where it started now they're yeah. kind of a chain they have yeah, like yeah, yeah. multiple ones around town that one nice feels modern ones. like the original that's, like that's like old school you can like, you can tell that the wood has soaked in mm-hmm. all the smoke oh, everywhere presidents have eaten there you know what I yeah. mean like it's it's famous, so we'll go. We'll stop by there too. We're not that far from there. You think well, Trumps went there and ate there? I really doubt it. He doesn't seem like a. He doesn't seem like a barbecue a kind barbecue of guy. Barbecue guy. Not really, does he? Nah. All it's right. a shame. Can I share a little it's family the, news? One of the finest foods of America. Oh, bar- I love barbecue brisket. Oh, oh yeah. Bris- Texas brisket, man. I'm. Uh, for, I think everybody knows, but uh, Dallas, Texas, is my hometown. So I'm actually going Saturday. I'm actually leaving. Uh, like I said, we always sit down and record this on Thursday. But I'm leaving Saturday morning. Uh, with my wife and son, we're going out there, spend nice. a few days with the family, and, and then uh, they're going to fly back on Tuesday night, uh, and and then uh, we'll start fight week, and you get in on Wednesday I get morning. Wednesday morning. So it should be a good week. We, we'll ha- we'll have fun in Dallas. But I wanted to share some. It's kind of related to MMA, but kind of not. 
but it's my family news. Okay. But my son got his first broadcasting gig today. Oh yeah, <laughs> broadcasting what? <laughs> they uh, yeah, this is kind of funny actually. Uh, so uh, it's funny because a couple weeks ago, uh, and he's he's you know we've shot some videos over the years where I've kind of held him or whatever, and you know he's given like a prediction or just kind of said a word or two on camera, just just kind of a little shtick to have a little fun, right? Mm-hmm. But lately he's kind of taken to like. What's the one thing he used to? Say? That's true. Uh, this is honest. This is honest. This is honest. <laughs> So uh, yeah, so lately though he's taken to like uh, he'll he'll be in my office uh, at home and and he'll go through my gear and first thing he likes to pick up the camera and and I'm like whoa yeah. big man whoa whoa hey <laughs> hey hey you gotta get don't him drop that bro. yeah exactly don't drop that like not that I have the, I don't have as expensive a cameras as you do but I still need to but use you still it. need it I still need it <laughs> uh, so I, I get a little worried but he he plays around with that. But lately, he's taken to just grabbing uh, my stick microphone and uh-huh. walk around, and he'll be like, "Ladies and gentlemen, this That's is the, awesome. you know," and he just starts like putting on a show or whatever. So we got a uh, a message at the school that he goes to um, that they're doing a little like good morning video, I guess, mm-hmm. that they tape, you know, with various students, just say hello, you know, this is what's going on today, this is the lunch today, you know, mm-hmm. um, and so he tried out this morning and uh, and was approved. So he's. So like he does it? Is it his part with a bunch of other ones, or is he I just? Think he I, the, yeah, I think they're. I don't they know rotated, how many people, but I th- yeah, I don't think he's like the anchor. Yeah. You know what I mean? But I think he's like one of probably well, a bunch. If he if he works hard enough, that's what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying? Like, pre- principal, I know the uh, the other kids are kind of good, but you know how good I am, principal. You know, if you give me the shot, I'll run with it. I will make it my own. <laughs> And how can he say no? <laughs> I'm just saying. So uh, That's yeah, cool. so I'm pretty excited for him. That's it's, cool. I, I think uh, yeah, this dude is is not shy of the camera. So I think uh, he might have a broadcast. Career That's cool. Someday. We'll see. I was gonna say. I mean, I was thinking about. It. I have like a couple extra like old film bodies that I haven't used in years. That I'm always like, man, I should gift it to like a kid that I think would do something with it. But it's then and not you have once to, like, you thought of my kid. Well, I did, but I actually <laughs> just did. But I was thinking about. But then you got to go get film. Oh, oh, it's like a film. Like a, oh. It's a film camera. It's not DSLR. So you have to, you have to pay for film? Yeah. You oh, gotta, no, no, no. Like, give it to somebody else's kid, <laughs> exactly. man. Exactly. Don't give it to my kid. <laughs> you know, because I'm like, I'm like, oh, man, it'd be really cool to like no, no. teach somebody, you know, about how film and how, you know, you have to make a decision before you snap that picture, you know, because, you know, say this roll's only 24 exposure. You get 24 shots. That's it. You know, you got to make them so count. True. Boy, that is so true how photography has changed. I yeah. mean, it, we always joke about it, but it's true. I mean, nowadays in journalism, I mean, the days of specialty, specialty have kind of gone away. I mean, yes, you're yeah. a videographer, but you're having to do a lot of stuff too. I'm a writer that's had to learn videography, <laughs> photography. Right. And we always joke like at the weigh-ins. Like when I'm shooting weigh-ins, for instance, for stills, I mean, now I will say I'm proud of myself. I, I don't do auto settings anymore. I do manual yeah. settings. I, I'm starting to understand it better. You know, 15 years later, I'm starting to get it. Um, so I, I do manual settings and, and I shoot it, but I, I literally just put it on like rapid fire exposure right. and just go, because I know one of them is going to come on. I remember like Wade from MMA Heat yeah. uh, busted us, busted <laughs> me one day. He's like, you know, John, because in- inevitably he's always right next to us in these scrums and stuff. and, and uh, or he at the wiggles way his way in there somehow. So I'm shooting next to him and he's like, you know, John. The best photographers only need one shot, and I'm like, "Well, sir, that is not me. I am not the best photographer. I'm just, I'm just running." But it's kind of funny to think about that. I mean, at a, at a typical UFC weigh-in, for instance, you know, a, a twelve fight weigh-in. A, yeah. a, a, now it's a little different because I probably shoot less of the official than I used to because it's faster. Yeah. You know what I mean? Since it's ceremonial now, but in a typical on-stage weigh-in, I'd probably shoot eight hundred frames. Wow. You can't do. I mean, if you were shooting regular film. Wow! Can you imagine? I'm just trying to do like uh, I wonder what some of these costs of one. But yeah, you figure even then, the time it would take to kind of, to kind of just keep switching roles. Oh. You know, let me put it back in the safety thing. Let me put the cap on. All right, let me open up another one. Let me let me feed it in oh. here. Funny, it's crazy. Funny. I mean, we we definitely have the luxury now, especially. I mean, there's something uh, romantic and still beautiful about. You know the whole process of film and right. you developing know developing it. it and doing all the different things that you could do it, but yeah, the the luxury now of being able to kind of just keep shooting and get that shot that you really need. You know that's perfectly composed, that's that's in focus. Whereas before, you know, I guess there's there is something to the 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 look and feel, especially if something is actually reproduced in an actual photo. 
the the softness that you know that's beautiful about a photo you know like that that i think we miss sometimes digital is so it's too crisp it's right. too sharp right you know and then we, we end up trying to fake it out and you know and Adding trick it out to and make effects. it look like the old school but uh yeah so but not a but just hearing you talk about that made me think about it. i was like man i should give those away but i was like nobody wants to deal with trying I to have to order film because film. film is still not can you get it's film? not cheap can you get fi- film developed anywhere anymore yeah you can even just take it to like walmart they still develop film? Yeah. Interesting. At least I'm, I'm pretty sure. It used to be able to take them just like drug Walmart. Store, right? the dr- I used to go to like the drug, drug store, stores. Drug stores. I used to go to like Kodak uh, stores. Or were there stores? There used to be. Yeah. Like, like photo were. photo places would yeah, either do it. Yeah, when we were little kids. I remember like uh, back home, there was uh, like the big stores, like the Kroger's or Myers or like, um, but I want to say like Walmart, Sam's Club. You can go and yeah. drop off your big bulk uh, photo and then you come back and. You just open up the package. You're like, oh, I hope it was in focus. Yeah, hope it was in through. focus. I have probably a package somewhere in a box somewhere of just like reels from over the year. I remember I had some from a trip to like Italy that I never developed. That I remember uh, I had a, ba- a big crazy night of like absinthe and other shit there that I took a bunch of silly pictures. I'm almost afraid to like ever develop it because oh. I'm pretty sure there was some random shots of like, your, my own junk inside, like the bathroom, because <laughs> I remember I had absinthe and I was like smoking my Cuban cigar. I was like, "You can't do this shit in America." I snap, snap picture, and I remember I, I'm pretty sure I took a couple <laughs> you of can't random pull junk, your pictures. junk out in America. <laughs> <laughs> absinthe makes you do some funky shit, you know. That's the real absinthe over there. It was, too. it was the shit, dude. So, that's funny. That's yeah, funny. so that's why I never, I never developed. I remember I was like. I was like, there's like a handful of ones I know I shouldn't develop. Because develop whoever developed it like 10 years like, later, do you, and like cops show up at your house, all of a sudden you get early. Like, what happened? Like, what is this? Uh, I, uh, yeah, I'm Ken Hathaway. I came to uh, pick up. Oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Who's that guy? I'm, <laughs> I'm Cole Coffee. I came to pick up my uh, my photos, and they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, They're ready. Uh, let me just go to the back and get them. Like, uh, uh, Las Vegas Metro, he is here. <laughs> He's uh, here. We have Mr. Coffee. He is here. <laughs> and they. <laughs> <laughs> just swarm in to come pick you up. Ah, oh, dude. Uh, but yeah, so that was that was that's fun, man. But yeah, that was a crazy, crazy time. I mean, like you never knew what you're gonna get. You never knew what you're gonna get. But mixed martial arts finest podcast, the <laughs> MMA Road Show. Uh, no, but <laughs> junk pictures, <laughs> pictures of your Patreon members. You will be the lucky owners. <laughs> you get the original pictures. The original junk shot. Ah, uh, too good. All right. Well, speaking of trying new things, well, that I was gonna say trying new things. I don't know if that was the best. And yeah, pulling out junk is trying to. Anyway, <laughs> that's, of trying that's not new for anybody. Let's uh, let's be real. Cold coffee, court reporter. Whoa, been on this Nick Diaz beat, man. I'm I, the beat. Uh, let's let's kind of lay it out because this literally just happened this morning. You were there. Um, all the our, only one there. The only media member that was there. By the way, I mean, even though all the other reporters that are on the MMA beat in Vegas are our boys. We're throwing them under the bus anyway. <laughs> Weren't there? Only cold coffee. Even though, man, they they got the connections. That are like, oh yeah. Like, I guess if you do it long enough, you realize that hey, you can call the court, you can get stuff. If you know that it's going to happen, like you know, just like today, I went. Oh, I called first uh, to go down there because you know when I learned last time it was scheduled for one, so I showed up like at twelve something. Like, okay, I'm here an hour early, just like junkie does. That's I get here do. early. And I walk into a court to see the judge and like the one of the prosecutors and some defense attorneys all turn around and look at me like, "What are you <laughs> doing here?" And I'm like, "I'm here for the one o'clock." Thing. That's not awkward at all. I, uh, it was so fucking awkward. It was uh, we're here for the one o'clock, and then they were like, "Oh, well, it's been postponed, you know." But here, you can call this number. You could call the courthouse. Blah blah blah. If something happens and we hear it beforehand, we'll let you know. Save you a trip. I'm like, "Well, that's smart. That's you learn something." So today. I called probably around uh, nine ish, a little after another, nine. It was another one o'clock hearing. Another today. one o'clock hearing. So I was like, "All right, I'm not going to be stupid. I'm not just going to go down there." So I called around nine ish. I, th- I think it was nine, exactly nine thirty, and uh, was talking to uh, the uh, they called the judicial executive assistants, and I was like, "Hey, you know, explain who I was, what I was trying to do." And I was like, hey, I'm looking for information on the Diaz case. You know, has it already been heard? It's supposed to go on one. What's the deal? She's like, oh, let me look. Let me look. And she's like, oh, this one. Yeah, this this might go early. It hasn't happened yet, but this might go early. And that was what I meant to say earlier because 
when I get there, I'll tell you. But uh, so she's like, this could come early, so you might want to just come down here and sit and wait. So I'm like, okay, fuck. You know, that's what I didn't want to do because typically, <laughs> if uh, a judge comes in, like part of the uh, etiquette, I guess. <coughs> excuse me. Is that if once the judge comes and sits at the bench and you're in there. You're really supposed to stay there for the whole time while they're there, even right. though I guess it's kind of changed. And I learned that from the other news guy a couple weeks back. He's like, I oh, don't know. They understand that, you know, you got shit to do. You can kind of come and go. Okay, so Because I don't think they so want public in and strict. out. But they the don't media. typically don't want public, but they understand if they like you're working, you're like, yeah. I can't just stay here for the whole court session, right. which could have lasted till say, maybe – uh, 10 30 or 11 something right. like that so if it starts around 8 30 so you could roughly be stuck in there for about two hours or so if they didn't allow you to leave but in this case so she's like you should probably get down there i think they're going to probably hear it early could be even 11 o'clock and at this point i'm thinking like oh shit i wasn't even dressed i wasn't really ready so i was like all right i got to grab my stuff it's going to take me about 20 some minutes to get down there i was like if i can get in there and hopefully i'll make the 11 o'clock time so boom, 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 run and get down there, go through the security like I always do. And they're always like, who are you here for? I'm like, oh, the MMA fighter. And they're like, that war machine guy, isn't it? Oh, I'm like, wow. no, 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 that's already done. Wow. It, that conversation happens every, every time. time. I'm, I'm like, brother, when are you going to remember war machine? That's that's already done. You know, up. It's literally that's the only person they know. That's the only name that they know. Um, so I get through and luckily the courtroom's right across the way. So I go in. And I see the judge isn't sitting at the bench. There's just uh, two metro officers in the back and the, the court uh, bailiff or deputy off to the left. And then it looks like maybe the court recorder or somebody that's working the computer. But that's the only two people that are in the courtroom. So I'm walking over and I start to take my seat in the little back of the area. And the, the deputy's like, uh, or the bailiff's like, he's like, you here for the Diaz case? Mm. And I was like, I am. He's like, it's done. It's been dismissed. I was like, you're shitting me. I was like, <laughs> no. I rush down there. No. And I was like, I even called and said, has it happened or whatever. He's like, yeah, I think it happened around 9.15. I was like, but I talked with her after, and she told me it was still but going But it hadn't on. been filed yet, maybe. But maybe or... not. I guess not. I would assume as the executive assistant or whatever that maybe she would have been in the court as it's happening, but I guess not. Maybe she's in a, a different area or whatever. Or the bailiff had times wrong or whatever. But as I'm saying that, this uh, this nice woman that was at the this desk, I'll, I'll just call her like the quarter. Record quarter or something. I'm not sure what she did, but she's like, I can send, I can email you the transcript of the, the court stuff. She's like, I was just getting done doing it right now. So if you give me your email, I can do it. And I was like, oh, that'd be awesome. That'd be great. And I'm feeling like... I'm like the man. I'm learning how shit's happening. I'm like, yeah, hey, you're sending me stuff. I'm good. And I go over, and that's when uh, she was like, all right, yeah, give me an email, and I'll send it over. And I just remember shaking my head like, just when you think you got the system right. down, you do everything that you need to do, and you still get there, and shit can still get just thrown around. And I think part of them being able to do it, since there was already an agreement uh, laid out with the DA uh, and uh, – the the client or I'm sorry the defense that they weren't going to do it they could pretty much do it at any particular point there's nothing that's telling them all right well this one o'clock's your slot right and you can actually see that in the transcript if you go and read it and she even says like hey this was scheduled for 1 p.m. yes your honor but we've talked with the you know the 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 DA and I believe they're not going to move this and typically what that even that isn't the first that they've talked about because I guarantee um, oh, the deals Goodman worked out went, before they Goodman show up. Goodman probably went back into yeah. the back office area and described and said, hey, this is what's going on. So just as a formality, I'm going to come early. I'm going to come at a certain point or whatever. Yeah. Whatever works good for you. Because typically when I was there before, they do uh, a lot of times in the, the first part of the morning um, – are the people that are in custody? Mm -hmm. They're they're handcuffed. That's right. They bring so them out. They like bring them out. They're the all they're and, all sitting there. So they yep. try to get them processed first, so that their lives can go on. Whatever has has to happen with them, um, and then they work all these other special cases. Even though the first time that this was going to get pushed back, um, they were able to. This was still able to happen before those. So for this to happen when it did, they probably ran through some of the other cases. For this to go at 9.30, because the last time, I think it happened right at 8.30, right at, like, mm -hmm. when the court opened up. So, um, yeah, but it was crazy, man. But, yeah, I was 
I'm looking around. I'm like, nobody's there. And it's funny because uh, Fox 5 is the only other uh, local station that has the rights to uh, shoot it. They are the only other ones that have been approved, like uh, Channel 8, Channel 13, okay. Channel 3. Nobody else besides 5 put in the same motion that we did to be able to record the, uh, the sessions. And, Which, yeah, uh, I should say, I mean, you had to file a request with the court. You can't yeah, just walk in with the You can't camera. just walk in and, and do it. You have to file it, and you have to get approved, and you have to bring copy that copy with you every time to show to the bailiff. And then they still present it to the judge and talk with the judge, and the judge still has to make sure it's good. Because they can, even though it was once approved, they have the, it's up to them whether they want to keep honoring it every time. Should something oh, be different so they can or whatever. Change if they want to. I think it depending on if something's going to happen or if yeah. they just feel like if something else is going on, I think they have the right to do something about it. I'm not sure. Yeah. I, that's the only we're, thing hey, I can think. As we're for, learning about that. That's why I thought it'd be fun for people to hear and to share. You know, I, mean, I mean, how many that, of us are on this court reporter beat? That, you know? That'd be the only thing I can a, uh, ascertain as for why they would always ask for the form and then mm -hmm. take it back to the judge. If it was like a done deal, why are you keep asking me for it? Let me just show you and let's be done. Unless they're like, maybe it's a, a bad day and she's like, I don't want to be on record or, you know, have them be well, just do they, audio I mean, record. I was going to say, yeah, because they I don't might think just, they have just that, do audio record or They don't something. have that luxury. I mean, they're definitely you know? on record. Well, and just, I mean, I guess just to say, I mean, this was, of course, the, the whole Nick Diaz situation. Uh, and I'll read this. This is exactly from Stephen Morocco's story. Uh, here, here's what happened. I mean, he was facing some serious stuff. Uh, prosecutors, you, you got to remember back in July, I mean, they added uh, extra, extra charges to him. This was... Yeah, a month ago, tried. they were adding extra charges uh, from Stephen Morocco's story back then. Diaz now faces three felony charges and one d misdemeanor. Uh, he initially was charged with a felony domestic battery by strangulation and misdemeanor domestic battery stemming from his alleged assault of a woman claiming to be his on-again, off-again girlfriend. Um, they added, you know, domestic violence by strangulation, they the domestic battery. I mean, all. I mean, he was facing some serious stuff today. While you were there, it was dismissed. Dismissed, I should say, with prejudice. And with prejudice, I, I followed up with uh, our buddy Mike Mersh, of course, a, a longtime uh, legal expert here. And I just wanted to make sure what the the dismissed with prejudice was. Because the district attorney said, hey, we're not going to file charges. And Ross Goodman, of course, who is Nick Diaz's attorney and who is incredibly connected here in uh, the Las Vegas area of course he is the uh the son of the current mayor and uh yeah yeah he's got some connections he's got some connections <laughs> uh so he's a man you definitely want representing you but you know if you read the court transcript we, which we actually posted on mma junkie the district attorney says hey we're not gonna f we're not gonna pursue charges and ross goodman says no this needs to be dismissed with prejudice and 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 the with prejudice simply means this can never be refiled again. I, I checked yeah. with Mike Mersh to, to, to make sure that that's what it means. He said, yes, that's what it means. This can't be refiled. And and the the words of the judge in there are pretty strong, man. Uh, you know, I think we were all worried about how this was going to impact Nick and his fighting career. I mean, it, this seemed like some real serious charges, but it seems like the evidence, I guess, in talking to this woman who filed the charges and, and – I mean, I know that domestic violence is a serious situation, and it, it's it's a real problem in our country right now. But it seems to me that after talking to that, everybody kind of agreed. Like, we don't think this this girl is telling the truth, basically. And the the judge, this was her exact words. I mean, the easiest way to district court is through the grand jury, and they say you can indict a ham sandwich. So that tells me everything I need to know. It's not on the state what's happened, but they couldn't indict this case. To your credit, and she's speaking to the uh, the prosecuting attorney. To your credit. You see it for what it is, and you're doing the right thing, and you're dismissing this case. The frustrating thing for me is we have a lot of true victims out there. And when you see stuff like this, and you take strained resources from the true victims, and it's frustrating for the court. But you did the right thing, and it's not you. I'm more upset with the people calling 911 because they're pissed off. I mean, those are strong yeah. words, man. Yeah. Strong words. So I guess you've got to say it. And, and again, we don't know all that happened. But for the prosecuting attorney to say, we're not doing anything, for the judge to give that type of uh, a statement, I mean, you, you got to think that, I mean, that completely vindicates Nick Diaz, right? I mean, at this point you say, that is an innocent man. Because, you know, we talk about this this Greg Hardy situation and we go, well, he was... He was prosecuted, and then he, and then he, you know, he, he uh, you know, asked for a review of the case, and they said, well, we can't find the girl, so he's technically not, uh, you know, been convicted of anything. But I mean, with Nick Diaz, I, I, I hear that statement, and I think 
let it go. He's innocent. Well, he Do certainly you feel that way? he certainly has never came out and said, uh, unless I'm wrong, that he didn't hit her or didn't throw her around. He kind of just, uh, I want to. I don't know how he really sort of addressed it. I still feel like you're right. I mean, like you feel like there was some type of physical contact. I think there was probably there's more than likely probably, probably some sort of physical contact, and I think um, whether or not uh, he was in his right mind and whether or not she initiated the contact and he re- reacted back, there was some sort of contact between these two parties. I mean, I think that's how we got to this point. Um, but it's not like she the, just created this out of thin yeah, air. You know, but I think for the fact that she probably did embellish her story to a huge degree and the fact that that story then kept switching because I don't think that she right. remembered the story that she set up in the first place where if it was completely true, I think the story would have stayed And it was super early in the morning solid. and they had been at a club and you know, there and were probably been, some cocktails and some whatever I mean, whatever I think else. they both even said that they had done some drugs earlier in the evening or something yeah. along those lines. So, I mean, yes, in this case, I mean, I can't hold the fact against him because he wasn't convicted in court. But ultimately, always inside, I would probably think that, that some sort of physical altercation took place that night. And as for whoever's right or wrong, I mean – they both could have been the wrong, you know. Right. So, but yes, in this not case, he is criminal, vindicated. Not something. Cr- I mean, to me, right. That statement from the judge is about as close as you can get. Because I know that you can't prove somebody innocent, right? right. I mean, you can't. I, you can't. I mean, there's no such thing as proven innocent, right. is there? I mean, if you're not, gu- I guess you're proven innocent if you're not guilty. I don't know. Yeah. But that's about as close as you can get to me of somebody saying, "Sir, we apologize. You are right." Well, it's certainly it's certainly vindicated to the sense where they're like, uh, it at least proved well that I guess justice did what it was supposed to do. Where if the facts weren't there and if the person that was making the claim can't substantiate it and there isn't evidence to 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 play out what was being uh, charged, that the system worked. The system said, okay, we don't have what it takes to do it. We're not going forward with this. That's how you want it to be, you mm. know. It sucks that it, it had to get that far for it to get, you know, to to the whole point where it's going to a grand jury that it couldn't get solved outside of it. But it seems to me that that it was a, a case of the court systems doing what you would hope that they would do, right? You know. So yeah, in this case, I mean, you know, you can't the the I guess the charges go away and, and nobody you know thinks any of the worst so I mean I'm glad I'm I'm glad I mean I just hope that she um, can find some peace and find whatever is lacking so that if this was a huge bit embellished on her part that she gets her mind right and, and gets good call gets uh, help for whatever you know caused it I mean it sucks if it did just stem out of hey we were fucked up. And whatever, and I lost my mind for a little bit, and I concocted this stupid thing. You know, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta come to Jesus on that, you know, and get your shit right, and you know, maybe come out, and, and it, it'd be nice to see an apology if it mm. does come out that mm. it was more bullshit. Um, <coughs> I doubt that would probably happen because then that would probably give legal rights for him to then maybe pursue Sue, her for charge, something, yeah, you know, for, for slandering and doing whatever. Or recoup something. his costs on his attorney. You know, all I'm that I'm sure Ross is not cheap. I'm sure he probably isn't, you know. Well, I, I should but. say Nick uh, was cleared by USADA earlier this year, so with this legal thing out of the way, yeah, he's, he's, he's got a chance to fight again. And he, he issued this statement, uh, by the way, on social media, which, which, I mean, you can tell he really spent a lot of time crafting this himself. And really making sure that his true character came through, his personality yeah. Yeah. came through in the statement. He said, I'm, I'm grateful this case is finally over. I want to thank my team and my lawyer, Ross Goodman, for the excellent work. But most importantly, I want to thank the fans who stuck by me throughout this process. I'm happy to put this chapter of my life behind me, and I'm looking forward to focusing on my return. Clearly, the words of Nick Diaz there. I mean, as soon as I, I saw the chapter, I was like, you know, it just makes me think of what a well read person would say. <laughs> And when I think of that, I think of the motherfucking Diaz boys. No human being talks like that. Much le- no <laughs> that's lawyer talk. No human being that is speaks lawyer like talk. that, much less Nick Diaz. Yeah, I think that was probably in with the lawyer fee. Is like, I want you to give <laughs> me a uh, Twitter Craft statement, my statement to, on social media. to put this out. But, well, uh, but it's good. I'm glad he did. I'm glad a statement did come out. You know, like, because, yeah. you know, some, sometimes uh, – 
people are, are very late in getting a response out, but I think in the fact that it was in his favor, yep. because when, when the immediate things happened, you didn't hear anything. Right. You know, so that that's what I think a lot of people are like, oh, shit, he's not saying anything. He's not denying. He's not verbally going out. You had this friend come out and defend him, and you weren't really hearing anything from his sort of side. So it's nice that something did come out on their behalf quickly after it so people can kind of, you know – sort of put an end on this, put a close on the chapter, and if anything else, rally around and support him, you know, like, it's cool. I think a lot of people were really hoping that this would go into, would go away and that it wasn't true, and um, they all got their wish. That's it. You know, so. And there ends another edition of Cold Coffee <laughs> Court Reporter. And this. <laughs> well, see, I, I, I was thinking that one, but or then typewriter I was, sound? I thought the typewriter sound at first, and then I thought, you know, if you had to make, so it's Cold Coffee Court reporter, it's just like a woo. Well, that was or supposed siren. to be a siren. Was like, that kind of sounded like a ghost. Dun, dun, dun. And then, and then it's oh, but you can't steal that one. That's dun, not. Dun, dun. So it's, so but it's if it's siren. done by me, it wouldn't be that. Oh, you can. <laughs> see, I don't know. Dun, 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 dun. And, then, and then, and then this, you get the siren. Dun, 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 dun. And then, and then, and then you get the 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 sound of the door shutting. The uh, oh, like oh, the court, ch- like chink. Oh, you know, like, like a, a jail prism, set. Like, yeah, I was trying to think of like what the courtroom door, and it doesn't really sound. It just sounds it like just a wood door shutting. <laughs> I don't think we can do that. I think you just got our podcast taken down, dude. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to get ripped off iTunes. All right, so good stuff for Nick Diaz because I'll be honest with you, man. Uh, both Nick and Nate Diaz, uh, I just want to see those guys fight, man. I don't always agree Fucking with the Bring it back on the same say. card. How about oh that? Oh, my just God. A Diaz that night, main ridiculous. co-main, and just rock it. Because those guys, man, to me, I don't always agree with how they handle themselves, you know, the things they say and the things they do. I don't always agree with it because I feel like sometimes, you know, like – like Bruce Buffer getting chastised the other day for saying, you know, I, I just wish he would fight. You know what I mean? And, and, and but he didn't say it like that. Well, no, he said bow. But <laughs> I actually talked to Bruce. There is the other no. Day. Yeah, I mean, like I talked to Bruce. I feel bad because I know Bruce <laughs> didn't mean anything by it. Like Bruce, he did, he but he didn't really defend time. it that well either. He's like, I just want you to like as a matter of respect to bow down. And somebody had a great point of when but it's they were not bow like down. That. It's bow, not bow well, down. No, but not bow but, down. but even like this, when you typically bow, if it's like saying a like. Japan or something like when the two people bow in respect, they're both Simultaneous bowing. Simultaneous respect, right? But if you're asking me to bow down, you typically are showing respect to a person in a position of authority. Right. So even if you are bowing to him, you are asking him to give him his, this position of authority. So you're asking them that. to, whereas they don't want to. But they, Buffer like, says that all the time, and he, it's in his. It's in his. True, I get it. I, I get believe it. it's in his but autobiography. It just felt like his defense. He says, did I, nothing ba- to like I bow him. to the Fertitas. I bow yeah. to, to Dana White. Well, that's because they are in a position, a higher position. They made him what he is. The Diaz guys made themselves what they are. You know, they made it, and they made some money with the UFC, but it wasn't the UFC that made them by any means. Diaz brothers made the Diaz brothers, and I think for them to be like, well, you need to, you know, so maybe the more submit. the proper term. Would it's have like been, saying if you're, you're asking them, them to submit, if you're asking them to submit, but like, no, it's not submit. It's show respect. Yeah, but but uh, typically a bow when it's done in a place, or especially another coach, right. you both bow, you both show respect. I mean, and right, so right. Dana's not gonna bow. I mean, he might. So maybe maybe if you're like, <laughs> he, he should give nod. him a, a head nod. Yeah, yeah. D- Nick, Nate Diaz should give him a what's up. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody knows like, the head movie. Like, hey, just hey, like, hey, 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 what's up? You what's made up? me rich. I made you rich. What's up? What's yeah. up? What's up, dog? I like that. I like that. Like, that's better. But yeah, it's just funny because I saw some pe- other people sort of saying that too. It's like, okay, but you're 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 not asking him to, you know, bow down. But again, you're still asking him to do something where it's putting him in a position of authority over you, unless it's a you know, a done together right. as a show mutual respect. Well, I'm hoping that we might be able to run into one or more of the Diaz brothers tomorrow if we go to this event that we're looking uh. at. <laughs> Received an invitation uh, to the release, the grand public release. Uh, they're not even paying us to say this, so I don't know why I'm saying this, but, well, I'm kind of interested. <laughs> Sending a note to invite you to the grand public release of Two Roots, the world's first Ooh. CBD and THC-infused non-alcoholic craft beer Making its debut at Las Vegas Relief. So it's non-alcoholic. It's non-alcoholic, but it has CBD and THC. Yeah, well, I guess the THC you see, you get off on the THC, and I can see where right. the CBD would help you with the, like your joints and helps other stuff. But yeah. I want to get a little something from it. But it's got THC in it. Well, I was gonna say, but if it, as long as it's got like at least the THC, I mean, like. 
Because I don't want to just like CBD non-alcoholic beer and then not get a buzz. So they're asking us to go. We got a, I got a media invite to go, and I, I hit the guy back, and I haven't heard from him. I, I told him I, I tried was hitting like, back in that last oh, you one. Did? I never got you a never response. Heard I told I him like, the dude probably got. He stoned when he sent the email and then completely <laughs> forgot that he, he's like, send us an email. I mean, I told him, like, I wouldn't mind just going out of person. I mean, like, just go pick up a couple cans and see what it's all about. You know what I mean? Uh, but, I mean, if there's if there's going to be some MMA fighters there, which I wouldn't be surprised, right? I mean, it, it is in Las Vegas and, and you know, quite a few MMA fighters stand behind the, the wonders the CBD, of uh, recovery? marijuana. Well, yeah, you hear a lot of guys. I remember, uh, he didn't, uh, Matt Brown or uh, was talking about CBD, uh, I think, towards at one point or somebody. But, yeah, you hear guys talk about it all the time, uh, using different CBD oils and stuff for recovery and shit. So you never know who you're going to do. I don't know. Might show up over there. We'll but, see. Maybe we'll run damn, not alcoholic, but at least it's got tea. So you want to have some alcohol in it, too. Well, I mean, it's hard when you put beer in it because then at that point you just call it, like, I don't know, CBD juice or something <laughs> or <laughs> something. I'm gonna get try your it. weed juice. I'm gonna try it. <laughs> I would try it. Try, but you want a little alcohol too. Yeah. I'm gonna do. I wouldn't hate on that. You know. I mean, you, you have, there's THC infused beers out there. I mean, like I don't why you had to make it non-alcoholic unless you're trying unless to keep the calories it. down or something. You know how much we worry about calories. I know, right? I'm just worried about that buzz, buzz per bottle. B B P B. <laughs> All right, let me, let's, talk, let's talk. I want to ask you too about this. Uh, Conor McGregor uh, firing out at Floyd Mayweather this week. Of course, Floyd Mayweather was approached and asked about, I guess, helping to train Conor for Habib or whatever, and he offered up his gym. And uh, Conor came back. Easiest and, nine figures he's ever made. I, I, I mean, had to do the math. I that was like, is true. Nine. I was like, one, two, three. That yeah. means that a hundred. That's true. I mean, a lot let's of, be honest. That's it, a lot of that zeros. That was the easiest boxing match he ever had for nine figures. A lot of zeros. Uh, F the Mayweathers, except Senior and Roger. There is no peace here, kids. Step up or step down is what Conor McGregor replied, which to me, the step up or step down is basically a challenge to a fight, right? I mean, that's saying either A, step up and fight me in the UFC, or step down and don't talk about me ever, ever again. I, I mean, I like it, I guess. Too. I mean, I get it, dude. It, it, by far the most traffic post of the day on MMA Junkie. I mean, when you bring Conor McGregor and Floyd Mayweather together, even a year later, people still get all riled up about it. So as a website operator, I'm all about it. But I just, there's no way Floyd Mayweather is ever going to fight Conor McGregor in an, in an MMA cage. And hell, I guess maybe. In the beginning, we said there was no way a boxing match was going to happen either. But, I mean, there's just no way they're going to fight in the UFC. So, I don't know. When I hear this stuff or see this stuff, whether it's a social media post, it, is it wrong that I just kind of don't care? Like, I I, I don't, I, I, I want to see this fight with Conor and Habib, but I want Conor focused on Habib. Yeah. That's what I care about. I don't know. I mean, I, I guess it was such a, I guess, big deal for me going along with it that I don't mind. Certainly there's a lot of worse things I would rather read about um, because it is interesting. I think anytime you still – one, the fact you've seen just Connor get engaged again, you know, for a while there, you know, I think with just dealing with the court stuff and raising the the young kid coming up, his mind has just felt like it's been elsewhere. But now it seems like he's back switched on into fight mode. And so I'm loving all the the chippiness, you know. So you like, well, do and, no, I hate to so of, I don't mind hearing about the. I was but, say, but I, also respect Mayweather as a fighter as well. So I like hearing him chirp about stuff as well, you know. I mean, honestly, out of all the other random bullshit that's in the news and other stuff that just is such a downer, this actually is kind of for me feels like lighthearted and fun because it's true. just sort of like whimsical bullshit. But it's like. That whole week leading up into that fight was just crazy. It was crazy work, and it was, like, crazy stressful, but it was also crazy fun. Right. You know, so that's kind of exciting. And I like the the talk now. You know, I, I like the the idea of just keeping it going because now there's some other fights, like the Javante Davis. I'd love to see him now fight TJ. You know, all these other little fights that are starting to kind of wet my whistle a little bit. I'm mm-hmm. like, oh, this would be cool. This would be cool. Um, so, no, I don't mind it at all. I mean – uh it was fun. It was such a shit show week, but dude, it was uh when it came down to it, it was fun. I it mean, just feel uh, big, and, and those guys got paid, so yeah. respect to them, right? And I think maybe now that I'm doing a little more boxing here at the little old uh, cold coffee gym, I'm mm. trying to pay more attention to some boxing stuff. So uh, I guess maybe I'm 
not as opposed to hearing boxing talk. So even outside of the fact of that you're taking an MMA guy and a boxing guy, just the fact that they're, you know, doing the sweet science, you know. So uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm with I that. Don't I, mind. See, I, don't, okay. I don't mind it, though. Let me ask you this, and this is, and, and I'm glad I didn't interrupt you so you could finish your point because you are right about that, and I think maybe you kind of swayed me a little bit on that. But what about the stuff with, like, the other social media stuff that he's doing lately, the whole, like, uh, you know, I'm training with, like that guy's Chechnyan or Dag. You know what I mean? Like yeah. the, the whole political play between Chechnya and Dagestan and all that that he's yeah. been put on social media. That seems to me like I don't say a recipe for disaster because I mean it's not like you know tr- tribes are gonna fl- flare up and fight each other. Right. But I mean, I also don't want to pretend like I understand the political climate, so I don't. I don't want to go so yeah. far as to say racist. But I mean, I don't know. That sounds weird to be like, yeah. man, those group of guys and this group. I, that sounds no, bizarre it, to me. It, Does that bother you at all? No, but I can I can definitely see what you're doing. But you're also talking to a guy where at one point Ireland was so divided where I think somebody could probably say and talk about what part of Ireland he was from. Well, you know, it still is, different right? Things. I mean, James Gallagher got incredibly upset that we had the, the, the wrong flag. Right. Well, that was – yeah. I was a little surprised that we did that too, but I guess it, it, it happened. Was, it was a database issue. It wasn't it just – Really? Yeah, yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, but I think – when you go to a place where a country has been, you know, has a big history, and especially when fighting and wars evolved, and as time goes on, you know, people tend to forget about the huge divisions and strife like that existed, from you know, and, and where it kind of comes. So anytime somebody brings that back up, we, for the most part, don't have a big history of that here in the state. We have certainly have our divisions. We certainly have our I mean, issues. There was this one war back in the 1860s. Well, that's the thing. I'm thinking but about. But nobody. That's the only war. But in the terms of how long our existence has been, uh, that war it was such a short not amount a, not of time. Not on native soil, at least, right? I mean, right. that's the only real conflict outside of, I guess, terrorist right. attacks that we've had on native soil. Right. I mean, if you want to talk about the North versus South, I mean, the, that was right. such a short war. When you're talking about countries where fighting's went on for ah, generations. Yeah, you're right, you're right, right. You know, so uh, so for any time that to me to bring that sort of stuff up, I guess there is sort of a mental side to it where you're almost like, wow, you're taking it to a whole nother level. Yeah, that's kind of what I thought. You know, but I'm not, uh, I'm not opposed to it, but also, again, you know, I don't, I don't get offended as much because I don't understand uh, the sides that much. I don't know True. how much each side was affected by the the different sides, you know. So, you know, uh, the fact Yeah, we that, know that there's war, but we don't necessarily know yeah. the full history of it. You know, uh, so if a Chechenian now is helping a Dagestani, even though, you know, it's like, well, you invaded our country and then took over our country or, you know, or I don't understand a lot of that particular stuff. Um but that's just my so own. So it doesn't offend being, you since you don't personally relate to it, basically. Because I just, I'm just ignorant of the situation. You know, it's same thing where I try to, you know, but I try to stay away from that. But stuff. is it okay to throw that stuff out there? Like, is it okay that he's putting that stuff out there? I mean, if you're putting everything through, I guess, a current today's politically correct view, everything you could find something wrong. Whereas before, you know, maybe, but it, since it doesn't really affect me, I don't put my same sort of, I guess, PC glasses over it. But I can see it as a whole, yes. I mean, I can see where somebody, if, if they're blanket trying to say, okay, does this statement, can this statement offend some group out there because of the history of bloodshed, the history of war, that one group will take offense possibly to this? But it's what can't, I mean, there's not a lot of stuff that you can really say out. I mean, there's so, you have to, I feel like there's so much that you have to watch what you say that if, right. you, if you try to put up where you're Political afraid that you're going to offend a particular group and in this one this is going going to affect a certain group it's only going to rile up the dagestani or the you know a, a certain selection of say russians or chechnyans or, or you know and i'm even going to speak wrong somebody's gonna be like how the fuck you just call us just russians or right. whatever you know you know what i just had i just had a thought so there's still no media events announced for this thing right and yeah we have the good fortune of talking to some people behind the scenes and we know that the reason there hasn't been anything announced is that they just haven't had a chance to get everybody on the same page and agree, right? I mean, we knew going in there wasn't going to be any world tour. Um, but I wonder, I mean, Conor McGregor, master strategist, right? Not not just in the cage, but incredible promoter, man. He gets it. He understands how to work people. And, and so far, they haven't even announced uh, any type of uh, promotional tour for this or promotional events for this outside of Fight Week, which at this point is like five weeks away. 
I wonder if that is um, kind of his strategy this time around. Because, you know, we talked about Mayweather and McGregor. And, you know, by the end of that, in fact, by the end of the world tour, I remember we were like, dude, stop talking. Like, I'm so tired of hearing people talk. I wonder if he's trying to take it the other way around where there's not going to be much talking at all. Like, we don't see these people together. We don't see Habib and Connor in the same place. And that might make sense as a marketing strategy, right? I mean, here, the guy was trying to throw a dolly into a bus to get to you, and you've never been together. How can you be on a stage together, you know, a few feet apart without making it some kind of big blow-up type thing? So you think maybe that's that's going to be the marketing strategy this time around? I mean, keep these guys apart as long as possible. Don't have them on the stage together. And, yes, these little – quasi-racist, quasi-internationalist type issues over here are going to be brought up, but nobody talks about it until that week when they're in the cage together. Yeah. Kind of, in my head, I kind of think like that's almost the way to go. Like, keep them apart. Don't put them together. Don't put them on the stage. Like, I've been thinking about where they're going to have this press conference or whatever, but, I mean, if there was so much animosity that, you know, you're basically... I mean, you're basically marketing this as like a war between countries, right? And then how do you have two guys on stage like the way Mayweather and Connor were just going back and forth and that sort of thing? I wonder if, you know, they'll decide, hey, the better way here is just to keep these guys apart as long as possible. Probably, and they're probably more worried about the crowd as opposed to anything else. I don't think they're Fair worried. I mean, because it's easy enough to control two people. But yeah, but you want the image right. You want the image right. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like if you don't have security between them or something, you're like, yeah. I thought they hated each other. Why are they sitting three feet apart of each other? But Dana White's gonna jump in there and keep them apart. Yeah, you know, I don't know. I think they're more worried about. I w- I would be more worried about just the crowd. I'd two be, of the passionate, two of the most oh, passionate yeah. fan I, bases like, in MMA right now. Like I mean, you stick fucking media section right in the middle of two warring factions, and then like shit goes to hell. I mean, like, I'm grabbing my shit and I'm gone. It's <laughs> <laughs> a good point, too, You know, man. so, I mean, that's that's probably, I would think that would be a bigger Crowd thing about, like, trying to, you know, lessen that, whereas at least on an arena, they can sort of frisk everybody. They can do a lot of security. They, and they're already going to have all the staff on hand. So, that's a fair I don't point. know. I like it. Uh, I'll, I'll wrap all this up because we'll have plenty of time to talk about that coming up, and obviously that's going to be a huge fight week when it gets here, and I can't wait. But I'll tell you what, I found this quote this week, on, or actually today, on a completely unrelated note. Uh, I was looking at uh, some, some, some of the history pieces that we do, the MMA History Today pieces, and trying to pick out things that we could do and, and some other things. Um, but I ran aqu- across this story in our database at MMA Junkie from 2010. It was right after the James Tony fight. Um, and the headline basically was, uh, Dana White says we're done with boxing. This is 2010. And the quote was, uh, and basically it was after Randy Couture had beat James Tony, and they asked, you know, would you ever bring another boxer in again? And Dana said, I thought we answered this question in 1993, of course, talking about UFC 1. I thought we answered this question in 1993, but James came out and he picked a fight. We answered the question again in 2010. I don't think it needs to be answered again. I don't care if it's Floyd Mayweather or anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I just had to laugh when I saw yeah. that, man. I mean, obviously things change. I'm not trying to criticize Dana White. That is exactly the way he felt at the time. Uh, I remember the although same I bet clip he would have had Floyd Mayweather. Did remember, this get played? I don't no, remember. No, no. Okay. I mean, just remember the clip, you know, that everybody brings up when he was said, like, you know, he'd never have women. That's right. That's <laughs> and right. Ronda Rousey. But if there was somebody, it'd be Ronda Rousey. Yeah. Oh, so funny, man. I don't care if it's Floyd Mayweather or anybody else. So uh, I thought that was great. All right, listen, uh, another cool thing we got to do this week, the Darren Till Media Day. That mm-hmm. was uh, a big day. And uh, I want to set the scene because it was unique, right? I mean, you and I at this point have been to the Performance Institute quite a bit. They've been fantastic to us over there in letting us do some filming on our own. We've done a couple little one-on-one projects that we're kind of starting out doing. Uh, we've done plenty of media days and, and this sort of thing. But this was different, right? This, is, this, this was different. We show up, and we're all allowed in, but we're not allowed to actually see the training to start out with. So what, what we did is we came and we – we, we set up inside the media center, this big media center, uh, but the curtains were drawn, and Darren was on the other side of that glass uh, sparring, right? But we had to sit there and wait for him to to spar for a good half hour, 45 minutes. 
Um, but they wanted to have us all staged and ready to go because obviously his time is pretty tight at this point. Um, and so we sat there as a media. We made sure our cameras were set up. We made sure the the uh, the, the patented MMA junkie microphone stand was set up and ready to go. And Darren did his sparring. And then when the sparring was done, he came and talked to us. And uh, I thought it was a really interesting interview, to be honest with you. And 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 I'll, we'll just play it out. I'm sure you guys are probably seeing clips of it, but I figured, you know what? Uh, we had to edit a lot of words out of there on MMA Junkie. Uh, a lot of people might not have time to sit down and, and watch a whole video, but in podcast form, you get a little bit more luxury. So um, this is the full media scrum uh, with Darren Till. And uh, I will say, you know, we got to watch a little bit of his training before the interview. We didn't get to see the spar. We got to watch a little bit of the interview, or a little bit of the training. And I'll just say, to set the scene, uh, he looked like he was in a horrible mood, to be honest with you, man. He did not look to be happy. And I couldn't tell if he wasn't happy with the media being there, or he wasn't happy with the way training was going, or maybe he had a bad sparring session. I, I couldn't tell exactly what it was. Um, but that'll give you an idea of kind of the mood as he walked in. Uh, and I will say, I tried to lighten the, the mood with a little bit of a joke before Cole Coffee started rolling his camera. I just said, hey, that part of training we didn't get to see, was that a was that a spar or were you doing a spa? I'm not really sure, of course, alluding to the fun Mike Perry uh, incident that they had there. But uh, uh, unfortunately, you don't get to hear my cleverness because cold coffee <laughs> was not rolling just yet. Uh, but that's kind of what, what things are going on. That's how it played out. That's what was leading up to it. And then we sat down, and uh, and this is what we got from Darren Till. And you made a big decision to come out here and spend a lot of time in Vegas. Give us an idea, man. How has this affected your preparation for this Yeah, uh, I think I've just – with me being around my team 24 hours a day, that's what it's practically been like. And uh, everything's in one, you know, at the UFC Centre. So, like, as I get older, as, as I have more fights, you know, I find recovery's a big part of fighting. I feel like we need to put in as much time as with the recovery as we do with training. So, basically, that was one of the big decisions. I wanted to be like, I train really hard, you see, so I wanted to train hard. And then go down and recover my body with cryo, massages, ice ice baths, sauna, steam. So right now, you know, <clears throat> if it was in Liverpool, I'd finish training and, and I'd go off to other things, you know. Now it's just 24 hours. I'm starting to get sick of it, to be totally honest with you. I'm just, it's 24 hours. Uh, the fight can't come quick enough. It's like, I've, I I don't like saying stuff like this, but it's been 24 hours non-stop thinking about fighting. It, 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 there hasn't been any other, you know, Nothing else. I haven't gone the strip. I went the strip once. I haven't been going out. I've just been dedicating everything to this fight. Well, I wonder because I mean, obviously, it makes all the sense in the world to take advantage of this technology and everything's available to you. But you also know what got you to the dance, right? You yeah. know what I'm saying. So, was there any like concern on your part to to change up routine and change up how you got here? Well, no. But this is the thing. A lot of guys, you know, as you said, they, they, I think sometimes they forget what got them to a certain position. That's why I've brought my coach and my team out because it's sort of like, it's like Team Carbon back there now, you know. We have our set times where it's just us training up here. Uh, you know, it's the same routine as back home, just, you know, better facilities. The octagon's a lot bigger. We've got a ring, we've got bags, we've got a huge mat. We can, we can manipulate the heat. It's better, it is better, but, you know, my my humble opinion is is if if, if you're a fighter you're, you're you know you're fighting for titles you're, you're you're a high level fighter you see a lot of these guys switching up camps switching up trainers i haven't switched up anything since i've started in this game uh, there's actually more people t you know we've had we had two two of the best jujitsu players just coming along just to train with us so there's been more you know people coming to the team it's, it hasn't just been team carbon it's been a few guys in there. Can we come and train? Yeah, of course. Come, come along. Come, come and show us, show us some stuff. So. I'm sure everybody here wants to know where the uh, where the weight is right now and how yeah. that compare to normal. What's what's the weight at right That's now? That's the only. It's shit. It's shit. It's fucking. I hate cutting weight. I, I hate making weight. I hate dieting. Uh, I'm gonna make this weight, so I can't wait to do that when I step on them scales. Uh, you know, I'm just. I'm. I'm in. I'm in that moment now where I just. You know. I don't. I don't want to train anymore. I don't. I don't want to eat good anymore. I just wish I had a ham, hamburger in front of me. But <laughs> you know, it's all sacrifices, and <clears throat> I made a mistake last time. And oh, you know, I just can't wait to say fuck you to everyone who just keeps babbling on about weight. And he didn't make weight. Fuck till fuck them. 
Darren, why, you've said a couple of times now about important to stay with one camp and all that. And, you know, fighter, I think a T.J. Dillashaw guy, they moved around and it really benefited him. Yeah. In your opinion, why is it important? Why does it work for you to stay at one place? I just believe... You believe in your coaches as they believe in you. You know, uh, <clears throat> it's like... I just believe in my team. I believe in... In, in, in what they bring and they believe in what I bring and I believe in my coach yeah you, you know I, I, it's a big part you know if you're fighting for a guy let's say for example Tyron Woodley or, or Stephen Thompson or s someone else you have to bring guys in to fit their style but I, I, I don't I'm not the type of guy to like go looking at f you know f for that style here or there you know it's it's all in team carbon you know if if, if, if we can't get it to team carbon when we'll just we'll just have to work work something out a solution out. It's not. I just it definitely did benefit guys like TJ. But I believe in my team. I believe in my coach. I believe in myself, and it works. You know, loyal loyalty. Is there a level of trust that you have to have in a coach like where now you know you trust your coaches because you've been with them for a while and maybe new ones you may not trust the same way. Yeah, I just. <laughs> Whatever me, to be honest, whatever me coach says goes. You know, uh, lately I've I've been in a bad mood and, and 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 he's been saying stuff and he knows he's 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 getting on my nerves and you know he knows the drill. I'm I'm low on food. I'm just moody. I'm training hard. But whatever he says, I I don't answer back. I keep my mouth closed and I do everything he says. I, I never question what he tells me to do. Inside the octagon, inside the training. And outside, so it's not just like inside the gym, it's like outside. So even sometimes there's things that he says to me and I don't, you know, I don't want to do or I don't agree with I just get on and do it because I know it's all beneficial for myself. So Darren, like reading your body language today, you look absolutely miserable out there, okay? Yeah. I mean, is that is that typical of you a week no. out or did we see you at a low moment today? No, I, it's it? just there. Uh, I'm just, I, this, this calm, like, as much as it's been short, it's been tough on me. Like so, I think just like these next few days, I'm just in a bit of I'm, I'm in a bit of a mood. I just I don't want to see it because as I said, back home, you know, I, I get to the gym, I, I do me work, what needs to be done, and I leave the gym, and I don't see anyone until you know later in the night. Now it's sort of a bit like. I just, I feel like the cameras are always on me, you know, I feel like there's people always just nagging me here, there and everywhere, and it is part and parcel, but, you know, you're just catching me on, you know, if someone brought me a McDonald's now, I'd cheer right up, <laughs> <laughs> but I, it's, it, it, it's what it is, I, I have me few moody days, I'm not a moody person, uh, you know, I've just woke up in, in one of them moods, I'm tired, you know, I, I just want the fight to be here, I, I've done all my work, I, I'm ready for five rounds, I'm ready for one round, I'm fit, you know, I've really put all my effort into training, into diet, and into into being the best me. So I'm just having me few off days. You know, it it it's not, and I don't I don't snap at anyone, and I just keep me me mouth shut. I get on with me work, and yeah, I had a moody day today. So you see me at not a low, but I was being moody, I was trying to kill everyone. <laughs> yeah, let me ask you the the whole thing about Usman as a, as a backup. I know he's supposed to be a backup for both you guys, but I think the underlying feeling is he's yeah, a backup for you missing weight. Yeah. Uh, I mean, what's your thoughts on that? Do you, do you say, hey, hey, props to UFC, or do you take that some disrespect? I, 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 to be honest, right, I, I don't really care. Uh, I feel like I'm the only fighter who's ever missed weight in the UFC, to be totally honest. I feel like anyone who, who when we talk about weight now, it's that until, that until, you know, there's, I missed weight. People need to just get off it. Uh, if Usman's there and ready and and by some chance I miss weight and Tyron accepts the Tyron says he wasn't gonna fight him a scene. But it, it is what it is. They, they got the back up Us, Usman they've told him he's doing what they've told. So I, I'm I'm just not asked. I just I'm just focused on Friday making 170 and then Saturday I'm going in and absolutely fucking destroying Tyron Woodley. That's that's all I'm focusing on right now. I'm not focusing on what she says or what he says online or what Usman says or what fucking Billy Joe says at the top, whatever. I don't really care. That Dad and I don't care too, innit? Now, uh, Tyrone Woodley recently said, even if you miss weight, he doesn't want to fight Usman. He still wants to fight yeah. you. Yeah, he, he's training. F we all have different mentalities on this. You know, if, if I was if I was uh, in Tyrone's shoes and Tyrone, you know, missed weight, I'd fight Usman. You know, to me, wait, wait. 
when you say you're the best and you believe you're the best, you, you, you can fight anyone. You can you can fight anyone. So that to me, I'd I'd fight him. But I can see, I can understand where Tyron's coming from. He, he's training for a six foot two guy, bit big, you know. Should we say middleweight? Strong power, you know. Good defense, you know. Puts pressure on. Then his whole game can just get changed up for a guy who's sort of similar in in in, in himself, like. Same sort of size, wrestling background, both carry power. So I can, I can understand where Tyron's coming from. You know, he, he's being a, shall we say, a safe champion. But I can definitely understand his, his reasons behind it. When you say the weight cut isn't going good, is it just because it's miserable, or are you off? I just fucking the game hate plan? it. I just fucking hate it. I hate it. Uh, I could be three kilos from right now and. Yeah, it's. I just hate hate it. You when know, you're on point, I'm I'm good. I'm okay. I, I I'm I'm. This is probably the leanest I've ever been. Uh, two weeks out, you know. Usually, I'm still carrying like I, two weeks out to carry baby fat. You know, right now I'm I'm lean. I've got you know more muscle than than my last fight. I've I've probably got around the same muscle as the fight before was Cerrone, and that that wake up was just a fucking that was a piece of piss. So. Let's hope it's the same, but I just hate cutting weight. There's uh, only a few more fights at welterweight, and then that's me done. So if you if you take the belt, do you? Do I will you, fucking take that belt. Let me tell you about that. Do you plan on unifying the, that belt with the middleweight belt? Uh, I don't want. I've said I want to go to middleweight, but I I just I see a lot of guys now that they're chasing that money fight. The, the winning titles and then the calling the, the the higher or the lower category or the calling that super fight. I wanted to, you know, when I take that belt, I want to defend the belt and then I want to go up to middleweight. But that doesn't mean I want to go up to middleweight and challenge the champion. I would like to, you know, aim my stripes in that division too. I feel like there's a lot of good guys in that division. You know, there's one guy I wouldn't like to fight, Yo Romero. I'm glad he's gone up. He's a fucking beast. But uh, <laughs> uh, I'd like to, aim, I believe in life, no matter what you do, you have to earn your stripes. If I did go to middleweight in the UFC, again, you know, offer me the my title, I'm not going to say no, but, you know, I'm saying I'd love to earn my stripes, you know, I'd love to fight the, the, the top five, the top ten. So, for me, going up to middleweight, I'm not focusing on the belts because, as I say, I know I'm the best, I know I will win that belt as well. It's interesting because after Liverpool, you said, I'm not interested in the welterweight belt, I want to beat everybody, right? So, mm -hmm. I wonder, do you think it's maybe that attitude that, that helped you get it instead of, Asking and challenging, you're like, dude, I'll take yeah. whoever, whatever. Yeah. They got you this spot. Yeah, it could be the, the you know, the UFC. Listen, I, what what you see is what you get with me. I, it's a hundred percent. You don't get no scripted shit. You get what what. Sometimes I might I might say controversial stuff, but it's all that until, and 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 that's the truth. I I just want to beat everyone. I, I, everyone in all divisions. To you know, to to the sit back when I finished and say. I was the fucking best. I was the greatest. I beat everyone they put in front of me. I'm not scared of anyone. I don't care whether you're a wrestler, you're a jiu-jitsu fighter, you're a stand-up fighter. I want to put myself against you and I want to see you as better. And if you had a guy who was going to beat me, I'll take that loss like a man and I'll go back and, you know, I I'll work on myself. That that's how I look at fighting. I don't look at fighting as getting in, making money, fighting this guy, that guy. Fuck that. I'm not here for that. The face off with Tyron, I mean, we all knew you'd tower over him, but when you got there, did it surprise even you how much bigger you were? Uh, a little bit. Uh, I just, I think, as, I, as I've said a few times now, I just made myself look big, you know, I, I puffed my chest out, I put my arms in the air, you know, it was sort of that stance that made me look bigger. But yeah, I was on that day significantly, you know, uh, significantly bigger than Tyron. I just think with Tyron's top off, he is a big guy though. He's you know, his his chest is buff, his big arms, his huge legs. So in in, in the octagon it, there will be a slight difference, but not not massively, because he, he's a big dude. So lay out the perfect scenario. You're saying one eighty five is on the on the rise and lay out the future for Darren Till. You win this belt, you defend once or how many times is there a name and then you go well, give me what's the perfect scenario for Darren Till? <laughs> Everyone I just I wanna I just wanna win this belt. And then, you know, I, I want to defend it. I just want to be able to say I've defended it, you know. So you could be looking at two, three fights at welterweight and then, you know, that that's me done. I, I'm not putting, I'm 25 now, I'm not putting my body through this, you know, for much longer. It, it's, I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, I, I'm here today, I'm, I'm, I'm great. I, I'm, I've got me, me chef with me all when he's fucking doing a perfect job. I feel good. I just... I just want to be able to eat some white, white rice. <laughs> I'm just fucking hungry, that's what it is. I just... 
it, it, I don't, I'm starting to, as I get older, I'm starting to see that it's it's just not necessary. You know, it's a lot of weight to cut and, and I don't need to do it, you know. And I started at welterweight, I'm gonna finish at welterweight and my ultimate goal is to be the welterweight champion. In two weeks, I can be making that goal a reality. And then after that, I, I wanna defend and then it's probably me going to middleweight. So that that's how I see my future playing out. Darren, I wonder, you know, as a young guy, boxing is really big in the UK. When you were looking to get into combat sports, what was it that led you to MMA as opposed to boxing, given how big boxing still remains in the UK at this point? I just, I just in Liverpool, I just, I felt that there was just need for something like what's ha happening now. Like, uh, we had a, we have today, and we have had many great world champions in boxing, many great fighters. I just, I, I always want to be different. I always want to be that special guy. And, and we never ever had like a, a UFC champion from Liverpool. We never had that that UFC, shall I say, you know, I don't like to consider this, but superstar. And, you know, now in Liverpool, I can, I can see everyone really coming together. I can see there's billboards all over the gaff. People are coming in the thousands. So, you know, it, it, it's like the weight of Liverpool is resting on my shoulders, as many other guys, but... I just want to be different. I, in anything I do, I always want to be that different guy from, from the crowd. Like when Bisping came up, I mean, it was kind of a similar thing. He fought in Manchester and had those had those big things. Uh, is that is that kind of like, did you look at him and see any way that, you know, a, 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 you took something from him, what he did? No, it, it, Bisping was on his own path. He was, you know, you could definitely compare the two, but he was on his own path. He was doing what he was doing. And, he, you know, he came up to America. Uh, I, I just got into MMA and I just, as soon as I started training, uh, uh, and that was it, I was just, I was besotted with, with the sport, I just wanted to be the best, I just, I said to everyone in the gym when I was younger, I said, I'm going to be better than everyone in here, and I'm going to be better than everyone in the world, and some may not have believed it, some may have, but that that's just the mentality I had, I didn't ever look to anyone for inspiration or, you know, there was, there was, there was people who, who would do great things and you would, you would admire them, but never... I don't want to ever be inspired by someone else. I want myself. I want. I want to inspire myself. And lastly, when when you're in the gym, like you know, you said, I want to be the best in the world. Was there a moment when you said, "Hey, I'm on the right path"? Where you beat somebody in the gym, or maybe in, in a specific fight, where you said to yourself, "Now I know that my dreams can come true." Uh, not really. I, I remember starting at the time when I started Team Carbon. There was like seven present UFC fighters: Terry Atom, yeah, there was Paul Kelly, Paul Sass. There was there was so many. And I, on a daily basis, I remember they used to just, they'd, they'd submit me, they'd, they'd beat me up, they'd take me down. And, and I just used to think, one day I'm going to get every single one of you back. I'm going to destroy all you. I'm going to be the king of the gym. I'm going to be the king of England. I'm going to be the king of the world. I, I never ever thought I'm going to be on the right path. I just knew every day, just keep taking them punishments, keep getting beat up. Keep getting, you know, setbacks here, there, everywhere. Just keep moving forward, you know, as a famous quote from the Rocky film. And and, and that's all I'm going to keep doing, you know. Uh, there's losses are going to come. It's all, there's not all positivity. There's negativity, as, you know, negative things happen. You've just got to keep going and that's what I'm going to keep doing until I reach what, what I, where I want to get. Let me just follow up on that because you know confidence is such a huge thing at the highest level of sports right and so sometimes when people fail maybe they, they question themselves hey, am I good enough you know you obviously when you had failure you use it to fuel you to get better. Did somebody help you with that or was that just a natural thing that you had? It's just natural I just I, I refused to, to be second best I refused to be second to any man on this earth in, in what I'm doing and, and, and I've never had a plan B I've never had a plan C it's always been plan A to be the best at what I'm doing and, and that is MMA and it's just I, it, it, I can't really explain where it comes from just in, in my own mind you know I don't know what goes on up there I, I just I just believe totally that I am better than anyone at this I just believe it, it it's it's not fake or you know thingy belief it's it's a hundred percent what I believe and I, and if that's what I believe, that's what I believe. Is there anything Tyron does that's better than you've seen before? Be, be, is there any, like a skill or technique or something about his game that you haven't faced before that you look at and go, that's pretty impressive, that's that's good? Yeah, every fighter I fight, I, uh, if, if I talk shit or whatever, that's just talking shit. But respect as a fighter, I respect everyone. They've all got 
something special, otherwise they wouldn't be fighting in the highest level now. I, I just think everyone talks about Tyron being a power puncher, a strong wrestler, a, a physically strong guy. People forget the fact he's really intelligent. He, he's, he's a very intelligent guy. He knows how to break fighters down. Like right now, I can guarantee he's watching with his coaches how to break me down, how to beat me. That That's his skill. That's his, his best attribute. Mm. I'm sort of the same, but in a different way. I'm not strategizing. I will strategize on the night. Let my coach do all that. I will figure Tyron out inside that octagon, and, and and I will beat him. And he will not have seen some, you know, shall we say, a young kid like me. But that's Tyron's best attribute. He's, he's a very intelligent man. Darren, what's your most underrated attribute? I mean, we talk about everybody talks about your size and your strength, but what is the part of the game that a lot of people may overlook? I, I've got many flaws. I, I, you know, I feel like I, I want to, I just, after this fight, I want to really work on, on, on the art swab. Like, I want to really work on jiu-jitsu. It's not, it's not that it's a bad thing in my game. Like, I, I'm good off my back. I can get back to my feet. You know, I've got a few sweeps, a few submissions. But that that is something, you know, I look at some guys. We had Andre Galvão in uh, last week, and I just look at how he, they move and, and how they are on the ground. And... It, it inspires me some a little bit like to be like them. Like I look and I think, ah, oh, I need to work on that. So I, I'd say like m my biggest flaw is probably you know jujitsu. Jiu Not that I'm bad at it, but I w I wanna I wanna be, you know, as as much as I, I know I'm a good striker, I wanna be the same at jujitsu. So I'd say that that's my biggest thing to work on. Anything else? Thanks, guys. Thanks, okay, guys. thank you guys. Yeah. Sorry for being a moody twat today. <laughs> <laughs>
I wouldn't say big, but you could tell that the cut had been going on. He said he was a little bit leaner uh, than where he was at this point last camp. So maybe um, we won't see the 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 dying of the till like we saw, mm-hmm. you know, in that video that his team released, or at least that the person Sponsored that was able Patty to, Bauer. you know, to see. But uh, I don't know. Um, from, he was giving all from from the way he was interacting the other stuff you could tell he was doing the weight cut so he was dealing with yeah. it so i mean if he's if he's working on it right now i have i have the confidence that he'll make weight you know um it'll be rough for him but uh no i, I think it'll, i think he'll be there i think he learned his lesson at least in the sense of when well, you could tell uh, he's still angry about it he man. is he is angry about it but i mean you could tell that he learned his lesson that he's going to do it but you know uh, i think a lot of people would think uh you know, myself included, that if that was such a big deal that I would have probably had tried to do it earlier so that the week before I would have maybe been already in my near target range, if you, if at all possible, Mm -hmm. you know, so that next week, you know, maybe you have like five pounds to cut, you know, so there is some sort of a cut or even 10 pounds, right? You know, I, I, it looked like there was definitely more than 10 10 pounds, there was more than 10 pounds to go. But, you know, I think if, you know, if I had that big of a deal where, you know, it was to that bad, I would try to, you know, change some things. But, I mean, that's why people are, you know, really push for it. Why, why guys are, are killing themselves to go to these lower weight classes where they are the bigger size guys where it's like, you know, do your body a favor, go up, you know. And he knows that that will happen eventually. Yeah, you can you see know? he's accepting It'll get there. it. It's not even – it's yeah. almost like he's looking forward to it. Yeah, you see some guys that, you know, try to say, no, this is my weight class. This is mine. I, I know this is my weight class. You know, I remember Gastelum used to always be like, no, this is yeah. this is my class. I'm going to do it, you know. Now he loves being, you know, at a higher weight class, you know. But um, I, I'm confident he's going to do it. But, you know, that partially could that could be because I really like the guy and I want to see this fight happen. Oh, that's going to be good You fun. know, um, but I like what Woodley was saying. Woodley at the media lunch today was like, you know, you know, if he comes in, you know, it's it's till or nothing for UFC 228. All right, so know? I want to ask you about this because I see a lot of people kind of giving Woodley grief for this and saying, you know, uh, you know, they've got Usman lined up. And, 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 you know, Woodley has said, like, look, if it's a non-title fight, that kind of sucks for me and my legacy. Um, but I think it should be a half-title fight. If he makes weight, it should still be a title defense as far as I'm concerned. But um, Yeah, because what happens? He, he would still lose it, right? It would just be like if he if Till didn't make weight and he lost, then the belt is like up in the air. Right, like it's, it's up straight, in the air. Yeah, so, um, I, but but the UFC for whatever reason doesn't look at it as an official title. I had this argument one time with I think Mike Which Vaughn. Which is crazy because it really is metrics. because if because if it's not, then you if shouldn't it, be if, able to if take the, the title away. If the doesn't make weight, it ain't my fault. It should right. still be a title defense but anyway. Right. Um, because right. if they can take the belt away from you, you're de- you're then it's a title defense. You're winning that belt. You, you couldn't take it from me, but they could take it away from me. Yeah. You don't get it, but they yeah. can take it. So like if you can't count it as a title defense, then don't say that you could take the belt away. I agree. All right, so uh, that's an exact point. Hey, we can still have this fight, but I'm the champ no matter what. No matter At what. At that point, okay, it's not a title defense. But yeah. if my belt can be stripped of me, then it's, it's a, a title, title defense. defense. God damn it. Right. seems like a no See fucking brainer. what I'm talking about? <laughs> uh, all right, but I saw a lot of people giving grief for acting like – well, Tyron should be ready to fight whoever. I don't. I to be honest with you, I like his take. He's like, yeah. listen. He's not saying. He could, now this would be the take. This would be the take that you wouldn't like if he said, listen, if Till doesn't make weight, I'm going home. Right. Okay. That would be a problem because you're like, hold on, hold on. The UFC lined up a backup, and you're saying you won't take the backup, and and now you're just going home. That's not what he's saying. He's right. saying. I don't give a shit if homeboy's 180 pounds. I got ready to fight him, and if the commission says I can fight him, I'm fighting him. Right. How do you not respect Tyron Woodley for that? I dig it. And half the times these guys, every time, well, not every time, but we've seen more times than not when a person takes the fight against the challenger or whoever that uh, came in overweight, they lose a lot of times. So for him to be willing, knowing that his belt can be lost it might not be darren's at the end of the day but because he didn't make, but it wouldn't be his either so i mean he for, to be willing to put your belt up uh regardless you, you gotta admire that and and i make sense i mean if you're training for a guy that's gonna come at you like darren till i'm not gonna be working on wrestling all the time i'm not gonna be working on you know defending against the grappling that's right totally different than how you're gonna be trying to to work a fight against usman 
I mean, like, it seems like a no-brainer. I mean, it's not – it's one thing when you say, like, I'll fight anybody anytime. Sure. But with a camp. Right. Nobody's just saying, like, hey, it's it's Tuesday. You know, Joe, Joe Schmoe's offered me a fight on Thursday. Let's do it. Yeah, I mean – that can be done, but I mean, the sport has devolved, I and mean, there's a lot the more work in level. it. Yeah, I mean, and there's strategy, there's game plans, repercussions. Yeah, I mean, there's, and especially in, in a sport where, um, you know, you take a couple losses and you literally can lose your job. Yeah, you could be out of this organization. You got to take those losses. You can't just be willy nilly. It's one thing to, the fights there, and you want to go out on your shield. You want to, oh, I'm sorry, I kind of threw threw the game plan out the window, and I just went all in. That's that's one thing, but to, you know, at least give yourself the the chance to prepare properly for your opponent. I agree. Get your body in the right at the or the right situation. So yes, in this case, he would still be in peak form, but his strategy in his head is a whole different place, and that's half the battle. I think you know if 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 Stephen Thompson was the backup, then you go. All right, yeah. you know what I mean. Similar like, style, you know what I mean. Like, Similar body. Types. If you're supposed to face Damian Maya and they got Talis Latus as the backup or something, like, you know what I yeah. mean. Like, I get it. At that yeah. point, you could make. But, dude, you're talking about polar opposites between yeah. Darren Till and Kamaru Usman. So, I respect Woodley. And like I said, if Woodley had said, "I'm not willing to take a fight if he doesn't make weight, peace out. I'm heading, you know, I'm heading home." Then you go, "Come on, bro!" Like the UFC has a backup in place for right. him to say. Bro, I'll fight anybody. Like, or I mean, I'll fight anybody. But I, I, I need a camp, and, and this is the guy that I'm preparing for. And if he misses weight, I'll yep. still fight him. You know what yep. I mean? Like, I, I think he deserves respect, and I feel like he's getting more grief than he is getting respect. Yeah, I mean, I don't. Yeah, I don't see how anybody could really argue that. I mean, unless they're just completely in Usman camp, and they're just like, I'd just rather just see hit. that fight. I really want to see true. that fight because I mean, if he's will, if you're excited, if you're at all excited about this fight as it currently stands. With it being a title fight, why would you be any less excited about the fight if one guy is not going to be able to get That's the belt? It. It's it. still the same damn fight, you know. Like, Did you see the uh, the Darren Till promo that BT Sport put together? Yeah, I thought it was decent. Decent? I, yeah, thought, I thought it was, was good. Killer, man. That was good. I, I started I started looking at some of the ways they did it, and then I started breaking oh, it down. Oh, so you started breaking it down. Yeah, then oh, I was like, okay. I was like, oh, okay. Uh, but no, it was good. I mean, like, you were looking yeah, at it, it as, a, as a videographer, <laughs> as a as a film. But I liked it. I mean, it was good. I mean, it was good. All right. I, I started to think because I started phenomenal. even thinking about like, all right, is this the UK crew that's doing this and blah blah blah, as opposed to other like. I think it was actually BT Sport that did. Yeah, it. that's why I was like, oh, I would have been dead. It would have been better yeah, if it was done by. Did somebody. you see the? <laughs> have you seen the Nico and Valentina Shevchenko one? That one I haven't seen. Okay, so I don't think it's I think on we MMA a, Junkie yet. We, I, I okay, got I it. I, I got I it. Something. I think I'm gonna put it there. To, I'll put it there tomorrow. If it doesn't show up already, I'll put it there. Yeah. But, uh I think it's cool because, listen, we get it, right? Most people are sort of like, oh, Valentina is going to steamroller. And, and that's okay. I mean, I think that's what most people feel. And, listen, no disrespect to Nico Montano, but yeah. when you put their resumes together, yeah. like, Valentina's a badass chick. And if you have a couple bucks to throw towards an underdog, she's a big, decent oh, underdog. Nico's, you, Nico's tough as this. But yeah. it's, it is pretty cool. Uh, the, the theme of it is, like, it shows – it shows Nico's like improbable rise. Like it shows her as being the number fourteen pick. Oh yeah, and then you know the climax I mean? with that fight of Modafferi. That's it. So it, it does that, but it, it but <laughs> that but big it says, dramatic fight finish. It, of was, well, it was dramatic, <laughs> but but anyway, it says and the whole the it has it doesn't have so it's got like announcers in the background. So it, it paints the picture of her on her improbable rise to the That's top, cool. right? And then and then but it, so it says so then there's two taglines in there, right? So it paints the imp- the picture of her improbable rise, right? And it says, in order for your dreams to come true, and then it shows Shevchenko, and it says, you must face your nightmare. It's like <laughs> pretty cool, you know what I mean? So it shows, cool. it shows her improbable rise, and then it shows Shevchenko as like this destroyer, you know what I mean? And like the favorite and all that, and then boom, it ends with the face off, and they're going to do I mean, I thought it was legit, you know what I mean? Because yeah. listen – I mean, Although I doubt Nika would say that she's her nightmare. She's like, I ain't afraid of Of anything. course, but you know what I mean? Like, to, but yeah, to but paint a picture as wrong, because yeah. that's it, dude. Like, you you say you're legit. You know, everybody in the world is saying, like, okay, yes, you have a UFC title, but, hey, just keep it warm for Valentina. You right. know what I mean? For you to say, no, F you. Like, I'm I'm actually the legit champ. And in order to make your dreams come true, yeah. you got to face it. I, I thought it was cool. I thought that's it was well cool. done, man. I thought it was a cool angle, man. Who did that one? Uh, that was UFC. That was internally okay. done. So it was cool. Very cool. But anyway, I'll have that on the yeah, site. Yeah, no, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. I, I'll look forward. Uh, listen, we don't usually spend a lot of time uh, talking about other people's interviews, uh, but I did want to talk to you real quick about uh, the Cowboy Cerrone interview because you watched it live uh, yeah. on Joe Rogan. That was crazy. And, um, man, it's uh, of course, it's huge news. And that's not really an interview. That's just, like, get him high and let, and let Cowboy go. 
That's what. That's his strategy. I mean, that's like the MMA roadshow, basically. Yeah. You I know? mean, he pulled out. He pulled out this huge fucking pack joint, and, and then he hit it, and he was like, he's like, might want to take it easy on this. And, and I think. Uh, Donald was like, I don't really smoke all that often or whatever. And he's like, oh, you might want to take it easy yeah, on man. that. <laughs> and, he's, and, then, and then even Cowie was like, ah, getting high on whatever, doing drugs with uh, Joe Rogan. And Joe had it. What did he say? He was like, not drugs. He was like, just nature grown, something or other. He had a great way of spinning <laughs> it or something. But, uh, yeah. And then it was like, it was just like half the time what Joe did awesome was uh, – you know, uh, was just let Cowboy go. Cowboy was like in the best storytelling mode. I think it was that great weed that he smoked, and and they were drinking. He was drinking his Bud Light, so he was completely relaxed. But just went into like storytelling mode, and Joe did a great job of laying back. Yeah, let him talk, and then you know when he finished his point, would you, you know sort of chime in and say something. Where a lot of times people want to just jump in and interject themselves within a story where it's like let the story play out let the picture paint it stuff and the way that cowboy was described Cowboy's was a stuff, great storyteller great storytelling when he was telling the story about the cave diving accident all this other shit i mean i was so just like i was seeing it so vividly in my head i think i had a contact buzz through the the the, the computer screen watching these guys because i was like why am i seeing it so visually it was just it was all credit to, to story, how good right? I mean, that he was saying dude it, it was and i'm sure most people unreal. that are listening to the show probably checked out but if you haven't checked out the cowboy interview it was fucking i mean crazy. that story in itself i mean basically where cowboy admits he he was accepting of death basically, yeah. or was on the verge he was on the verge, on the verge of being until accepting the, of death until the fighter in him was like fuck that you know don't like i mean that's crazy. I mean, there's there's been there's been times. I remember, not that I would ever say the same thing. I remember there was there's been times. I remember once I went rock climbing. This was back in Ohio, and I was on this rock face, and I thought I saw a point where the rock sort of slid down. There was like a ledge that would go. So I pushed myself down in this position where I was going to go closer, and I couldn't get my foot on. I was like, that's so weird. So I was grabbing on this branch, and but I got myself into a position where I couldn't easily get myself back up. Right. And what it was, was it was a visual sort of illusion. The oh, rock okay, that I saw, really there, there was a rock hang that went over. The rock was about 20-some feet down, but it looked like it was a ledge, but it was just your eyes crunching the distance between the two. And at one point, I was getting tired. My legs were starting to get shaky because it was just in a little nub in the wall. And since my legs were getting shaky, I was like, oh, there's a little branch that's right there. And then maybe this little ledge, I could try to just sort of slide down and see if I can let my leg stop on the branch and see if it would hold me so I can then get help or whatever. And then I was like, all right, yeah, that's the way to go. And then there was a part of me that was like, no, don't do that. That's stupid. Like, don't do that easy little right. thing. Like, hold on a little bit. Look for a difference thing, you know. So I'm tearing in the wall found some other like tearing some of this moss to find another foothold and then did it long enough till a buddy was able to come down oh, wow. and i had a bag around my neck uh that had a little side pouch that i was able to grab throw the bag up and then have them sort of like pull me up but it was in that moment of just like one part if i would have just took the easy route where i was like oh i'm getting tired i would just want to just let me just slide down I would have slid to my death probably, that's but great. there was something. So like that's why I think part of his story resonated in me, and I think if anybody else has had maybe one of those close call situations that it's so true those moments, you know. And it just I had all the respect for him because I was like, dude, I, I I saw it in just that pit of your stomach when you think of that facing your ultimate your your end, yep. you know, and you don't realize how close it is, and then when you're able to overcome it, I loved it. The, the best part is after he got out and he was like, he's like, you want to talk about those woohoo moments like after a big fight knockout? He was like, that was the big one right there. It was like, because he overcame death in that situation. And I was like, brother, I get it. I get it. It was so good hearing his story. He intense. had he had me, you know, at the end of his finger. I was just, I was eating it all up. I couldn't, I, I loved it. I haven't watched a full, and I think I missed the beginning of it, um, but for the most part, I haven't watched a full Joe Rogan experience in forever. Right. My, I, I was glued to the to the screen. He was so good. That, by the way, that feeling, that moment, that reminds me a lot of Ma of me and Maddie Rad in the outdoor broth. <laughs> we, we almost accepted death. Almost accepted. I feel that was one of many. I, I think I probably <laughs> have had, but. 
Yeah. Uh, now, listen, it was it was a great interview, and uh, if you haven't checked it out, definitely that was good go shit. check that one out because it's legit. Now, it's made a lot of news, too, right? And and this is kind of what I want to talk about just briefly because I'll, I'll throw it out there up front. I'm a Cowboy homer, no doubt about it, man. I, I love Cowboy as a fighter, as a yeah. human being, man. One of my best. But he's made a lot of news because – uh, outside of his near-death experience, man, the, the scorched earth, so to speak, with with the Jackson Wink Jam has, has really caught a lot of the headlines. Yeah. And um, uh, I guess let me talk about that briefly, and then I want to ask you something else. Um, there was I, another point. I wonder if you if you caught on to it. I caught on to it, too, about Singapore. I don't know if you heard the bits when we talked about Singapore. We'll bring it up after this. Remind me to talk about Singapore. I didn't hear that part. I saw yeah. somebody reference that, but I didn't yeah. hear that part. It's hardcore. So uh, – so the thing is, like this, this difference between Jackson Wink and, and he said, "Listen, uh, you know the whole Mike Perry situation being brought in, and, and it kind of created a rift between them." I guess th- the way I saw it is because I feel like right now with the news that's in there, and uh, credit to Stephen Morocco who was able to get a, a hold of Mike Winklejohn and get his reaction to it, and he kind of described it. And if you go on MMA Junkie, you can see both sides of it. To be honest with you, it's not. I mean, we've been in this game for a long time. I feel like we've seen this story play out a lot, and I really don't feel like either guy is necessarily wrong here. And I see a lot right. of people picking sides, and right. I don't think that's necessary. I mean, here's what I see, and I've seen it happen a million times. Cowboy has been at this gym forever, right? He's been at this gym forever. But he's also at a point in his career where he doesn't feel like he needs to be in there grinding with the lower-level guys to help them with their training camps and to help them as a sparring partner and all that because he's got his own shit to worry about. Not only is his own fighting career busy enough, but now he's got this gym at his ranch. And, and I can tell you that the drive between Jackson Wink and where his ranch is, it's not short. I mean, it's probably it's not long. It's probably 30 to 40 minutes, but mm-hmm. it's 30 to 40 minutes of nothing. You know what I mean? It's just like this just stretch of highway. That's like what I feel like when I drive to your place. Oh, my God, you weirdo <laughs> fucking guy. It's like 15 minutes that way. I know, and there's, uh, there's like plenty to look at. I know. Well. Uh, <laughs> such a jackass. Out there in the outskirts with the, the zombies, outskirts with are. the zombies and like tumbleweeds rolling down the street. Uh, so I can see that you know, and Cowboy has like built his own facility, right? He kind of built things around him. He can train when he wants to. He doesn't have to be on anybody else's schedule. He can bring people out there. He can help people out there, which he's definitely done. And so he doesn't show up as much anymore. And I get that. You know what I mean? He's kind of earned that, to be honest with you. And I've seen this play out here in Las Vegas at multiple gyms in Las Vegas where guys are there. And then as they get further along in their career, they're not there quite as much anymore, especially when they're not, you know, in the middle of their camp. But then if you look at Mike Winklejohn, and listen, if you talk to people that are around the, 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 the that camp, they'll tell you that Greg Jackson, who is among the nicest human beings on the face of the earth, is not businessman first and never has been. You know what I mean? He, he'd he rather lose money, I guess, you know, and, and make mistakes in business to stay loyal to people and to – to 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 keep it the family and the people that he loves around him, you know. Um, but somebody's got to make business decisions, and they and they bring in a guy like Mike Perry. And granted, that's that is kind of awkward, you know. Um, but I get it, you know what I mean. Somebody's got to worry about the gym moving forward, and Cowboy is probably kind of nearing the end of his career, and he, and he's doing things more on his own than he is there. But I understand Cowboy's frustration at the perceived lack of loyalty. Mm-hmm. But I also understand the business decision as, well, listen, yeah. if you're not here, we've got to continue move on. So I feel like everybody's trying to find the right and the wrong and, and, and where the divide lies. And I think that that's the wrong way to look at this, man. I think that both these people are making decisions you know, with their, with their own best interests at heart, as they should. And it doesn't necessarily mean right or wrong. It just, to me, means... Those are the realities, the decisions that have to be made in this fight business, man. And yeah, that's true. what I see from the outside. I've seen, I feel like we've seen it happen here in Las Vegas a lot, and I feel like that's kind of what we're seeing out there. And um, I, I feel like everybody's trying to figure out who's right and who's wrong in this situation. Yeah, and I think what you got to do is step back and look at both people's point of views and realize, you know, could either guy have handled it differently? Maybe. I mean, sure. look, all of us in life, sometimes we, we go, ah, oh, damn, I could have done this. My, my wife points out to me on a daily basis how I could have said something a little bit differently or handled things a little bit differently. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I think both of their intentions aren't bad. Yeah, they're not trying to just ultimately screw the other or whatever. But, I mean, I get it. I mean, like, I think the thing that people don't realize about some of these gyms is, like, a lot of these gym owners are not making great money. They need no. – some of these extra things. And I think probably, especially for this fact that if, if Cerrone's training at the ranch half the time, um, 
and doing his own thing. These guys got to do what they need to do to keep the keep That's the it. lights on at That's the gym, it. you know. And, Bring and us some fresh blood. You know, it's unfortunate that it is somebody coming in, but you almost kind of like Wink would probably almost think like, bro, you're always at your thing. Like, I will still help work with you or do whatever, but, you know, we got to keep – you got to keep the lights on. We got to keep moving forward. If somebody's offering to do whatever, this is what the gym needs to kind of keep growing. But I could see where, you know, Cowboys like, I've been here longer. I've contributed more over right. the years. Even if know? I'm not here now, you know, I'm not here I've now. got a decade was, of history. Yeah. It's been Respect 10 years. my history. Respect yeah. my history. Like you've made money off me. You've and done I can whatever. See that point of view. And you I know? can see that point of view. It sucks. I mean, it's, it's, and especially it's from one of these gyms that even if, nobody's ever seen it or been there you know people have affinity for the gym especially from the the stars that have came through there the jones the Holmes, you know the the cowboys you know the the names can go on and on but um you know i can definitely see where some people might you know want to lean on cowboy because cowboy you know people love cowboy and the fact that they think a gym would want to you know maybe skip one paycheck if it's in the in the name of helping a guy that still has an affinity for the gym and still calls your gym as part of his home, even though right. he might do a lot of his training elsewhere, you would think that you could skip one payday. But in this case, you know they're seeing it as possibly more paydays because if his if if Mike and it works out, Mike could have ten more fights with the UFC. He could have more. You know, um, maybe we won't see ten fights more out of Donald. If Donald had his way, he'll have that in the next year. Yeah, you know. Um, <laughs> But, you know, and I think you're right when you touched on the fact that, you know, Donald is at the later parts of his career where in terms of maybe how many years are left, Mike is a lot, has possibly a lot more barring an injury or something of that sort. But, um, yeah, it sucks. I mean, because, you know, you feel for both sides. Yeah, man. Um, you hate to see people that you, that you like and you care about in the sport kind of <laughs> at odds, you know? And especially, I mean, outside of the fact that, you know, he's not training, I mean, he's going to have now – coaches probably in the opposing corner you know for the first time for him possibly and that's gonna you know play with his mind you don't want to see that as well you almost want to just see train Perry and then don't show up for fight do that out of respect right you know give well, him the fight week like, stuff hey, bro, and then just don't because ultimately what the fuck are you doing guy. on I'm fighting at you. yeah you can do some corner but you could ultimately easily Plug somebody else in. That'd be a fight nice night. sign of respect. That would be a nice sign of respect. That like, might be listen, nice to help patch things up. Like to say, you know, listen, man. I'm, I'm. Look, we did coach him. You're absolutely right. right. We got him ready, but we will not stand against you on fight night. Right. That, that would actually be a really nice touch. It'd be a nice way to go forward. But I, it's not like Mike doesn't have other people that he's worked with right. over the years, so he he has and other people point, to call upon. And he doesn't need a babysitter fight week to kind of really do it. I mean, you could either do it on the phone he's call or the, have another He's trainer. out there at the pool at his last one, man. He don't need no you babysitter, know? man. He's doing his own thing. That's interesting. So, so, all right. So, what I wanted to ask you real quick, uh, because your initial observation after you after you listened to that interview, you shared it with me personally. Uh, before I share it, do you still feel that way? Uh, oh. I think so. I think so. So, sh- you said to me, you said, I, after hearing this interview, I think Cowboy is not long for fighting. I do. After hearing him talk and just like life stuff and just other things and other things I think that interest him, I mean, he's got a lot of passions and a lot of things. I mean, I don't think so. I mean, I could see him. He's he even said about how he's going to use his connections to do like this car race. You know, it's like one of the ones where they just drift nonstop around in like the mud things. It's fucking nuts. Like these pros are going to let him go into a race and he's never done it before. And he's like, is there a place like a practice where they're like, you get five laps before he's like, oh shit. So I have five laps to learn this. And like Rogan's cracking up. He's like, bro, there's like, you have to like work this shit out, you know, but no, I'll um, figure it out. just hearing him. And I think with the, 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 near death experiences and the close calls and just the soul searching and this other stuff it's weird cuz the the other part that makes me not think it cuz i think he really you know in a lot of these like mushrooms he's really big on mushrooms now apparently um he really sort of questioned why you know he kept asking himself why do i fear so much this thing that i love to do like why do i fear and why am i so afraid of getting in there and fighting but i actually he's one love of those it guys that gets nervous and he does but he loves the fight. adrenaline yeah. rush once it gets into it once he's able to get past that part but you know he absolutely hates it and i think that was the part where he was coming to grips 
and he was learning about himself. But I think in part of that learning about yourself, you will also learn that if it is just the adrenaline rush that makes you want to do it, you can either find that elsewhere or is it as important to you to do what you've been doing to your body and, and staying away from your family and doing this other stuff if you realize it all boils down to just this adrenaline rush that you were doing and you're able to get that adrenaline rush doing other things that maybe aren't as harmful for your body and other stuff, not saying that doing racing cars or whatever, but I don't know, just after having listening to it, I just, it just struck me in my head. I was like, dude, he sounds to me, he's coming off to me like somebody that's reached a point in his life where this isn't maybe, I don't want to say isn't going to interest him, but I just didn't feel that this is what he's going to want to do for much longer. It's interesting because to me, and I think it's one of the reasons that Cowboy is one of my favorite fighters, is not just because of his fighting style. I love his fighting style. I love love his attitude. But it is such an interesting case study of mixed martial arts because this is the guy that we think of. I mean, literally, when Tyron Woodley said, I'm not fighting Kamaru Usman on no notice, he said, go get Cowboy. He is literally the epitome of anybody, anywhere, anytime. Right. And yet he's also the one that admits, I hate this shit. Yeah. I, puke, I throw up I, before I puke it. before every time I get it. Right. I mean, you think the guy that's literally, I mean, not just says it, but has lived anybody, anywhere, anytime, yeah. should be like, eh, man, I just got to the locker room, yeah. man, put my shit on, and let's go do this, boy. Yeehaw! Right. And that is not him. Yeah. He gets in there, and he's like, I'm never doing this yeah. again. And we, when I think about it more about it, this is the kind of situation, the whole stuff that's happened with the Winkle John stuff, this could – Almost, and I could be completely fucking wrong, but like, I mean, this could ultimately also be one of those things that like breaks his heart for mm. this for the sport. These are guys that he's been working with for you know ten years, and you know what's the point of doing right. it if you're losing half these these friends of yours that were the ones that helped build you up? And like he said, he still has a relationship with Gibson, even though Gibson's kind of doing a bunch of his own stuff as well. Um, you know, this might be one of those things where it's he's just not like, going to start over somewhere. He's definitely not going to start over somewhere. That's I mean, why he I was like, just he's not going to go to Bellator just, and, no, and get a new camp. And I don't go, think you know so. What I mean? like, he's 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 created what the great thing about Cowboy and his personality. He's opened up enough doors for himself that if Cowboy stopped fighting after this fight, he would find things to do. Whether it be Absolutely. movies, whether it be car racing, whether it be ownership of uh, you know different stuff. I could see him getting involved with the fucking PBR, the rodeo. Absolutely. I mean, like, there's a lot of other things. Not that that's safe some by TV any means. Shows and stuff, dude. But there's like, just, you tell me there's be just a, other things. A I host mean, of like a, you know, like TJ Lavin does all those like extreme sports shows right. and stuff like that. You tell me Cowboy Cerrone wouldn't. I mean, he's I mean, a good looking on. dude. He's got a personality. I mean, like, Cowboy doesn't need to fight. We need, like, we need Cowboy because yeah. Cowboy, what he brings to the sport. But at this point, he has enough other stuff. He doesn't need this anymore. Right. So. I don't know. I don't know. What was his Singapore story? Singapore thing. This was what I thought. I just about shit myself when here. Remember when we went to Singapore? I only heard bits and pieces. When we went to Singapore, what was the biggest crazy thing that was going on with the president or the or the of the the? I think it was the president, whoever runs the fucking country. They were, well, no, the Philippines was where they were killing drug dealers. But well, Singapore, but Singapore was doing some of the same sort well, of Singapore stuff. Has they that were thing cracking that, like, down. Singapore has that thing that, like, when you fly in, like, right. on the visa paperwork that you fill out, and I've taken a picture of this and put it on social media before, it has a skull and crossbones on right. there, and it says, drug trafficking will be punished by death. Right. He says in the thing, he was like, yeah, for the Singapore, I was kind of a drug mule. And I brought, he, I think he brought a bunch of mushrooms and shit into the country Holy with him. Holy shit. He brought, and so one, I'm like, dude, now you're never going to be never able to go to back Singapore to that again. fucking country. Nope. Or they'll just fucking lock you up because you just gave them proof or whatever. But it just made me think, like, dude, dude if, if he was popped, if he was caught there, what that would have done. Like, I'm sure the UFC would have been able to pull strings to get him out. But it would have been a complete... PR nightmare oh for the UFC, but yeah, he pretty much admitted that he. he I, it was weird how he used the firm term because when I think drug mule, I'm thinking you're bringing drugs for other people, right? You know, so well, for the fact to him, well, I mean, I assume <laughs> he was bringing them for himself, but I guess he brought them for others as well. But I mean, you just don't hire a mule to carry yourself. Well, I don't know if thing was mad at that he was hired. I think he was just like, I'll bring it in. Like they're not going to check my shit. Like. I got the party covered oh. or whatever. But, yeah, I think he – I I don't know if he actually said that it was, but the way that he's been talking about how he's been eating mushrooms, I assumed it was mushrooms. But he did say he was a drug mule for Singapore and he brought drugs into the country for that fight. Well, that beats my Singapore story of <laughs> being pushed down the street in a shopping cart at like 4 in the morning by a friend of mine. 
Yeah, that's that's kind of that's kind of lame, lame shit, compared to this have, one. <laughs> like, had some good this stuff. was like some real deal shit. But yeah, when I heard that, I was like, "You're fucking kidding me!" Like God that could have been really bad, God but it wasn't because that's cowboy. <laughs> That's the road show right there, God damn. Yeah. That's how we do, except we don't do that. No. That's how we do, but we don't do. We don't. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, listen, uh, it's been fun catching up. I got to get out of here. Uh, I got things to do. <laughs> I got to work early in the morning tomorrow, and then it's off to Dallas on Saturday, starting fight week early, go see my family. I'm excited about that, and then you'll join me later in the week. So uh, we'll be we'll be loaded up. We'll have full coverage from Dallas. We'll try to sneak in a little and a half. We're going to try to work together. Uh uh, we got some ideas for Patreon. You know, we we've, we've let that go to the side, but but we want to do some exclusive stuff to like bring people into our more, family, more behind the scene. Bring, bring it, bring, bring it into, into the into the show because we love meeting you guys and we love talking with people. That's so true. If we can bring it into the family, we'd love to do that. But MMA Junkie doesn't want none of that. They don't, yeah. don't want to see the family. Psh. <laughs> so if you guys are in Dallas, hit us up. We will be uh, oh. working our asses off, but we will be having some libations. Damn right, we will. In the meantime, thanks for listening.